All right, if you'll find your seats, we're going to continue a uh, revisit of a series that I, I started going through next uh, last week. Uh, we were in Romans chapter 1 in the morning service, and the Lord put it on my heart to preach that message from James this morning on the perfect Father, uh, looking at how great our Father is and how, how fortunate, how blessed we are to have Him as our Father and everything that He's done to uh, allow us to be His children uh, by making Christ's salvation available to us. We're going to continue the series that I began last Sunday morning next week. I, I may go back to this in the morning service. Um, just bear with me. We'll, we'll, whatever the Lord puts on my heart, it'll be one of those services. We'll probably continue in this. As I was telling uh, Brother David this week, yeah, this is a, a series that I had preached a little over a year ago, and the Lord uh, really just put it on my heart to go back to this. The need of the hour is great as we consider where our nation is. I've mentioned it many times. I have gone to this passage, this chapter many times. But as you look at our nation, you look at the condition of our nation, and you read Romans chapter 1, you can see our nation following this path. And the message is entitled, The Spiral of Rejection. To our last week, last Sunday morning, we looked at verses 16 and 17, Paul's great proclamation, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. What we see then in verses 18 through 32 at the end of the chapter is what happens to a person, to a group of people, I think we could safely apply this to our nation as a whole, when the gospel is forsaken. Now Paul again, very, very confidently standing on the gospel, it is the power of God, it is what saves us, what Jesus Christ did. But when a person or a group or an individual says, that's not for me, I don't want this, then what you see is a spiral of rejection. You see a downward slope. If you were to look in the book of Judges last week, we referenced Judges, and um, in Judges chapter 2, it talks about a generation that arose and knew not the Lord. My comment on that at that point was this, that how do you imagine that generation arose not knowing the Lord? It's because their parents didn't see fit to communicate the truth of what God had done. All the wonders. In fact, if you look at that, you look at how God led them out of Egypt. The, he showed his superiority over false gods in Egypt with each of the plagues, targeting one of the Egyptian gods. They proved themselves to be false gods. They had no power over the one true God who is in complete control, not of just one thing, but of everything. And the nation of Israel was brought out with a strong hand, as God promised would be the case. And Egypt decided, ah, we don't want to get rid of our free labor force, and so they pursued the Israelites. Well, we know what happened. God, uh, he split the Red Sea. And yes, Moses held up his staff, but it was God that split that sea. And they walked on, on dry ground, and they got through, and then the waters came in, destroyed the, the, the most powerful army on the planet. They couldn't. Stop, Almighty God. And so he judged the Egyptians. Israel gets into the promise, or not into the promised land yet, they get into the wilderness, and instead of being able to go right to the promised land, they murmur, they complain, they rebel. God judges them, and he tells them that this current generation is going to wander around for 40 years until they're dead. The next generation will get to go into the promised land. And, and while in that while in that desert, that wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula, God supernaturally preserved their clothing so that it didn't wear out. Because where in the world are you going to get? They don't have Walmart in the middle of the Sinai Peninsula. I mean, they might now because it's the, the mid 2020s. But um, you know, 4,000, 5,000 years ago, there wasn't a Walmart in the middle of the Sinai Peninsula. So getting clothes was not exactly an easy thing. They wouldn't have been able to uh, carry around the livestock in the numbers that they could had they been stationary. And 
So God preserved their clothes, their shoes. He gave them manna. He gave them quail. He provided for their needs, and he provided guidance. He came as a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke to help the people know where they needed to go. The, the tabernacle was a place where God's presence came and dwelt, and so he was always with his people, even in the middle of all of that upheaval, even in the middle of uncertainty and even judgment where they were told they can't go to the promised land, God was still with them. And then that old, that old generation passed. The new generation came on. Moses, because of his um, impatience, he was told to speak to a rock so the water could come out. He got angry because of the people. He hit it with his staff. And water came out, but God said, you're not going to the promised land. He let him see it. He took him up to a mountain just before his death, and he let him see it, but he couldn't go into the promised land. Joseph, who had been his right-hand man, basically, was allowed to take the people in there. The Jordan River is stopped. They cross over the Jordan River, and it's not just a little stream. It's a pretty, in, in many places, especially during flood season, it can expand quite, quite wide. So God stopped those waters, and they went through on dry ground. He gave them victory in Jericho. He gave them victory all, eventually in Ai and in, others, in other places. And in spite of all of that, all the wonders that God had done, the parents of those, those generations, the parents that had seen the victory, had been part of those victories, just kind of got tired of talking about God. And he ceased to be wonderful. He ceased to be full of awe and, and respect and, and amazement at what he had done. And so the people stopped talking about him. They treated God as just, you know, yeah, he was there for us when we needed him the most. You know, kind of like the friend you call up when you're in, in a jam, you call up God and he can help you out of that pickle. But with, with God and his people, they failed to see that they needed him all the time and he ceased to be their priority. And folks, when God, and, and we're, we're celebrating Father's Day today, so let me maybe address this to the dads in here. If, if God is optional for you, he's not even going to be considered by your children. If God is not your number one priority, you're leading by example. What kind of example are you setting for your children? And there arose a generation that knew not the Lord. Parents failed. I mean, there's, there's failure in our generation as well. You wonder, we're going to look at some things in a little bit here. Uh, but you wonder why our nation is in the condition that it is in. Well, if you'd go back to Judges, and, and we'll go to the very end, Judges chapter 21, verse 25, I want us to see basically a verse that could summarize the entire book of Judges. Judges 21, 25. This is a very sad, tragic commentary and really condemnation of the nation of Israel at this time. In those days... There was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Could the same not be said about people in our nation today, around the world? That every man does that which is right in his own eyes. You live, we live in a society where truth is condemned and where lies are portrayed as truth. Where you're told that you can live your own truth as if we have the opportunity, the authority to determine what truth is independent of God. Jesus didn't say, I am one way, one truth, and one life, but you're free to choose your own if you think you've got a better solution. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. And words matter, folks. I know it's uh, the word the, but every word of God is pure. And, and he put the word the in there for a reason. He's not just one of many ways. He's not a way. He is the way. He is the truth. There is no truth apart from God and apart from his word. And yet we live in a society where truth is rejected wholesale, where we are told uh, that, that lies, what we have known as Satan's lies, are that's the truth. And everybody can do what they want. Everybody has their own truth. Well, we need to get back to God's word, and we need to pray for our nation to get back to God's Word. I know we're, we're just a few weeks away from celebrating our nation's independence from the tyranny of England. And as, as patriotic as, as we can be, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for what our nation has been. There are many of you in here that have served or are serving our nation. I'm thankful for that. But I am not proud of what our nation has become. Our, our nation is just begging for God to judge it. 
And so as we celebrate patriotic holidays, may those celebrations remind you that you need to pray for this nation. And a point that I made last week, and we'll get to the outline eventually, but a point that I made last week was as we consider, and, and the message last week was entitled America, the Gospel, uh, America's Hope, I think it was. And what I, I tried to encourage you is that the focus of getting the gospel, the focus of even praying for our nation, must not be patriotism. Our goal must be souls. Our goal must be to, to give souls the gospel, the power of God unto salvation, not just so that our nation can rise back to where it was. Folks, I don't think we're going back. The ultimate goal is souls need to be saved, not our nation needs to be strengthened. It would be nice if our nation could be strengthened. But our number one goal, because we're not citizens of this world primarily, we're not citizens of this country primarily. We're citizens of the kingdom of God. We belong to heaven, and we need to seek a better country. So we need to pray that souls will be saved and make sure that our patriotism doesn't get in the way of our Christianity. Let's look in Romans chapter 1, and first, as, as it relates to the truth, we saw Paul talking about the gospel being the power of God, its ultimate truth. We're going to see what happens when there is repression or when that truth is withheld. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And so what happens when truth is repressed, when it is, when it is stifled? Well, we, we see that even happening in our nation. You know, there, was, there was a time not even too long ago where, you know, yes, there were people who had differing views, people who rejected the gospel, rejected the truth, but... You know, people were more civil about their disagreement than they are now. Now it's a bloodbath. And as, as you see you know, media stifling truth, um, not just political happenings, but even actual truth as relates to um, what God says about marriage and gender and sexuality and everything, we see what happens, and it begins with an ignorance of the truth. This repression of the truth begins with an ignorance of the truth. In 1962, in the case of Engel versus Vitale, and in 1963, in the case of Abington School District versus Shemp, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that devotional prayer and public recitation of the Lord's Prayer and reading of the Bible, respectively, were unconstitutional, and they banned them from schools. So, you have truth forbidden in schools. What happens when you remove truth? Something else is going to take its place. You've heard the phrase, nature abhors a vacuum. And, and I mentioned this last week because I think I used that exact phrase last week. I'm not talking about a Hoover or whatever vacuum you use. Um, a broom, a dustpan, your, your dog, uh, whatever it is. But nature naturally will fill in an empty space with something else. So when truth is removed, when truth is withheld, they, they hold the truth in unrighteousness, they, they exchange basically what God says for lies, then something else is going to take the place of that truth. And so then you have indoctrination against that truth. In the years following those rulings, those tragic rulings by the Supreme Court, with the absence of God's word and prayer in the public schools, unbiblical and extremely dangerous philosophies began to take precedence. And so people, and I mentioned this, that when you have a generation that is not raised with the truth, not raised with the Bible, not raised with, with prayer, then as they get older with a godless upbringing, assuming they have not been in church, then those children who didn't grow up learning the truth, become the leaders who are teaching lies. The leaders who have no knowledge of or concern with God's truth are now peddling philosophies that are anti-biblical. We see evolution, and I mentioned this at length last week, but evolution has become a steady replacement for biblical creation. Why, why is that? Well, 
it, we, we won't tonight look through all these verses in Romans chapter 1. I'd encourage you to go back and read through these verses because it is my intention to go through the remainder of this chapter and then we'll get back into our other study, probably in the Gospel of John there on Sunday mornings. But as you look through this chapter, it becomes very clear that man wants authority. And so all of these lies become presented as truth. And people turn away from God's truth, which, which works in hearts to transform them into the image of Christ. What happens is then you have to continue making things up in order to take God's place. If, if you can remove God... Somebody else has to become God, because he created, us to, he created us to worship. So if there is, in, in man's philosophy, and we're going to see in a little bit that there is no such thing as a true atheist, but when, when you have people continually saying there is no God, why do you think they're saying that there is no God? It's because they don't like God's authority. When they are exposed to God's authority, God's authority, God's truth exposes who they are, makes them feel convicted about what they're doing and what they're living, and they don't like that change. If you've ever been confronted by one of your parents when you were, you know, adults, put yourself back in your childhood shoes. And, and if you got confronted because you'd done wrong and you got disciplined, most of us, and I can speak from, from truth by watching my brother get disciplined because I was always a great child. Um, <clears throat> I don't know that my mom and dad watch this, but if they do, they could, of course, testify and agree with me. But no, when I, when, I was, when I was disciplined, which happened a lot, and when my brother was disciplined, we didn't approach those times of discipline saying, boy, mom and dad, I'm sure glad you caught me. I am very thankful for this. I understand that this was the best thing that could happen. I needed to get caught so that I wouldn't continue in sin. I needed that spanking. I needed to have that privilege taken away or whatever because... I need to grow closer to God and you, and that's the way to do it. We, we never approach discipline that way. And now having children that require discipline, none of them have come to me and said, Boy, Daddy, I'm sure glad you spanked me tonight. I really, really enjoyed that, and I enjoy this opportunity to get closer to you. We don't like discipline. We don't like to be confronted. And when God's truth confronts people. There is natural rebellion, and so the, the result is things like evolution and socialism and other ungodly doctrines that basically substitute God for man. If God's not the authority, then I can be the authority. Then I can call the shots. Then I can live by my truth. If, if I convince myself and try to convince others that there is no ultimate truth in God's Word and from God Himself, so I become the arbiter of truth. I become the one that determines what's right and what's wrong. And, and it might be right for me. It might not be right for you. But that's your truth. You live your truth and I'll live mine. And, and what I've used as an example before is my truth, just to see how ridiculous this is. My truth could be that it's okay for me to just go up and if, if Brother Michael Hurst and I had a disagreement and I could just, you know, and my truth says it'd be okay for me to resolve that conflict by just going and just punching him in the nose. And, and my truth says that that's okay, that that's the best way to handle that. Well, I can pretty much guarantee you that his truth <laughs> opposes mine. He would disagree that the best solution to that conflict resolution is me just bopping him in the face, all right? That's not going to help our relationship, okay? Um, and it's really not going to solve the problem. He might be inclined to return the favor. I don't know. I watched a video, um, there's a, a man, Ben. his name is Ben Shetler, his dad, Jim Shetler, was the campus pastor at Pensacola Christian College for a number of years, and Ben has an apologetics um, ministry, Truth for Life, and um, he interviewed college students on their campuses and asked them, well, do you think stealing is okay? And one of the kids said, well, personally, no, but, you know, maybe the person who steals from me um, maybe they needed it, and so for them, it actually wasn't wrong for them to steal. It was okay because it needed to meet their needs. And, and maybe, you know, and it's just all this, this nonsense. You know, it, there is ultimate truth, and it's, it's God. It's God's Word. It's what He has said. When people reject God's truth, they have to make up things. You think of evolution. The idea that, and I'll summarize, the idea that everything that you see with all of its order, now, yes, we live in a fallen world, but there's still tremendous order to everything that exists. 
And you look at your body, you look at, you know, you think of the doctors. I know several of you over the last year have visited doctors, and you're thankful that they understand what's happening in the human body, and they can take care of you. They can evaluate what's going on and give you prescriptions to help you get better, and they can give you therapy and do certain things that will fix the problems that arise in your sin-cursed body. But God has created order. He created a heart inside of you that pumps blood for most of us for our entire lives. And that could be many, many decades. Man can't make something like that. And something like that certainly doesn't just come from nothing. You think of your, and this is a regular example of mine, you think of your cell phone. Your cell phone did not begin as a table full of scrap parts and plastic and wiring and glass. And all of a sudden, you know, lightning struck it and it started to coalesce into one of the most sophisticated devices that this world has ever seen. That's absolutely ridiculous. And if you were to portray that to somebody and say, well, what do you think about that? They'd say, you're, you're, you're a fool. You're crazy. Things don't work that way. Order does not come from chaos. And yet, it's okay to believe that everything that we see came from a Big Bang. And we were just a bunch of primordial goop and mud and stuff. And all of a sudden, out of that, these little single-cell organisms began to form and they became more complex and then we were tadpoles and they crawled out of the water and became monkeys and monkeys fell out of the trees and now they're teaching in colleges and you know it, evolution does not make sense it takes more faith to believe in something like that than it does to believe that in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth and so we take god at his word well that repression leads to rejection in romans chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. This is talking about the conscience. Talking about inside of us, God has hardwired mankind with an awareness of right and wrong and of the fact that there has to be a God behind everything. If you look at most world cultures, now that there are varying degrees of morality, but in many of those cultures that, that don't have God's word, they know that Murder is wrong, and they will punish murderers, and that punishment varies from culture to culture, but there's generally a punishment about murder. They understand that stealing is wrong, and there will be a punishment for thieves. There are a number of things that, you look at the Ten Commandments, imagine that, God says, thou shalt not, thou shalt, this is wrong, this is right, and other cultures, even without a copy of God's word, know what's right and wrong. It's because God has put it in our hearts. He has made us aware. Continuing in verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Many a police officer has pulled somebody over for speeding or for any other kind of traffic violation, and the person driving has said, I didn't know that whatever the offense that they just committed was offensive. I didn't know that the speed limit had gone from 70 to 25. I didn't realize that, and so I just, just kept cruising on, and it's okay. And the police officer is going to tell you, your, your ignorance of the situation does not change the fact that you broke the law. People may try to stand before God, oh, I just didn't know. Well, no, that's not an excuse. Because God has, has put it in our heart through our conscience, and God has made it clear through His creation. Just as the presence of a beautiful painting assumes the existence of a painter, or the presence of a house assumes the, the existence of a builder, so the existence and order of creation clearly assumes and demonstrates the existence of a creator. Have you ever heard of anybody saying, yeah, this building just happened. My house just happened. Nobody built this house. Are you crazy? Nobody made this house. It made itself. Sometimes it'd be nice if houses could do that. But they don't. People have to make them. I have a watch that my wife gave me several years ago. Somebody had to make this watch, and all of the gears that go into it, and every, every link, they had to, whether it was a machine or a person, there was somebody that created this watch. The phone that's in my pocket, the phones that are in your pocket, the screens that are on our walls, somebody had to create them, and we look at them, and nobody would look at that screen in the right mind and say, yeah, I think that screen just randomly popped into existence over the course of thousands of years. That's absolute foolishness. Well, 
The Bible says, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. That's the definition of foolishness, foolishness, rejecting God, rejecting his word. And so when a person will say, there is no God, they display themselves to be a fool. They are ignoring what is clearly around them. Uh, go to Psalm 19, please. Psalm 19. And this, this whole psalm, really a beautiful portrayal of God's creation, but really I want to just look at the first couple verses here. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. Everything that God has made points to the fact that God made it. Now a person cannot look at a tree or look at the sunset and get saved from that. The gospel is not in the sunset or in a tree. But what the, that tree, what that sunset, what the beautiful ocean or the, the glorious majestic mountains, what those show is there is a creator and I am accountable to him. But what mankind does when they reject God's word, when they reject truth, is that they are they're trying to make up a way to, to live without God, trying to soothe their conscience, but deep down, there is no such thing as an atheist. An atheist is somebody who believes there is no God. An agnostic is somebody, you know, I don't know if you understand the difference between those two terms. An atheist, as I said, will just plainly say, there is no God. Theist, that, that term theist has to do with God, and the prefix ah has to do with no or not. It cancels it out. So atheist means no God, essentially. Agnostic means you can't know. Gnosis, there's a Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. And the prefix ah again means no, so no knowledge. I can't know if there's a God. There may be, there's just no way to prove it. That's what many people will say. And that's where probably most professing atheists ultimately have to land. But if they're honest with themselves, God's word has told us what he's done. God has shown it unto them. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Nobody will be able to stand before the throne of God one day and say, I just had no idea that you existed. Doesn't that get me a get-out-of-jail-free card? No, it does not. So, our responsibility, folks, is to get the gospel to every creature. Our responsibility is to reach out to those who are around us and to tell them, who it is that made all these things. In our, in our Wednesday series, uh, we were, a little bit ago, we were looking at the ministry of Paul. We were looking at how he ministered there on Mars Hill. And he, was, he saw all these altars to various gods. And there was the altar to the unknown God. And so he told them, I'm going to tell you who this unknown God is. And he, he made known to them Jesus Christ and, and what God had done and, and told them about salvation. And there were many that rejected. There were many that believed through that opportunity there. But Paul, Paul still had to stand for the truth, and those people wanted to reject the truth. They wanted to continue on in their ignorance. And I think that many in this world would say that ignorance is bliss, and they would just live on and think that they are free, living the way that they want to live. But folks, God's word could not be clearer that sin is not freedom, it is bondage. And what this world needs is not for Christians to just continue letting the world do its own thing. We're to be salt and light. We're to make a difference for the Lord. We're to present God's truth. So when you're at work and you hear somebody take the name of the Lord, your God, in vain, stand up for God. Stand up for his name. Don't tolerate that. When someone tells you that God's word is fairy tale, stand up for God's word. If it weren't for this book, we wouldn't have hope, folks. Stand up for God's word. When someone is saying, oh, well, I think that it's okay for uh, a man to become a woman because he's living his authentic life and he's living his truth. And you can say, no, God made them male and female. There's no in-between. And God does not give us permission to change what he has made. Ultimately, it's not really changing because DNA is still DNA. And regardless of how much mutilation takes place and how much makeup is applied and how many dresses are bought, a man is always going to be a man. And God's truth stands firm. So we have to stand for God's truth. Folks, we need to pray for our nation. We need to make a difference 
just as Christians around the world who have not grown up in, in so-called free nations have to do for their nation. And their goal, whether they're in China or Thailand or Russia or Brazil, their goal isn't, I want to make my nation great again. Their goal is, there are laborers that are needed in the harvest field. There are souls that need to be saved. Because again, it, in, maybe in America we struggle this more than in other nations. I can't speak for other nations because I've never lived in one. I live in America and I'm an American. But what I notice is that there are times where, if we're honest, sometimes our patriotism overcomes our Christianity. Is it a problem to love your nation to be patriotic? Not necessarily. I love my nation. I love what this nation has been. I pray for my nation. I'm thankful to have been born into this nation. But we are Christians before we're Americans. And so, as we seek to get the gospel out, it's not just getting the gospel out so we can make America great again. Put on your hat. The goal is, souls need to be saved. There are people who are living under the kingdom of darkness. They need to be brought into the kingdom of light. They need hope. They need truth. We have the truth. So we need to represent God's truth. We need to give God's truth. What difference are you making for those who are around you? You and I are not going to have the opportunity individually to go and to touch every single life in this nation, but we can touch the lives of those who are around us. And we are expected to. You've heard the story. I've shared it. Others have shared it. I don't remember who was the first one here that, that spoke of it, but uh, a grandfather and his grandson walking along the, the uh, beach, and uh, there were a bunch of starfish that were just scattered all over the sand. And the grandpa noticed that his, his grandson just started reaching over and picking one up and tossing it in the water, and they'd take a few more steps, and he'd pick another one up and toss it in the water. I mean, there's hundreds of them all over the place. There's no way he's going to have time to take care of all of them, and the tide washing new ones in. And so the grandpa said, what are you doing? I mean, it's not making any difference. I mean, look around you. And the grandson picked up another starfish, and he threw it in the water, and he said, oh, it made a difference for that one. And he picked one up and made a difference for that one. You may not have a chance to reach everybody in the world, but you can reach one person. You can reach your neighbor. You can reach your coworker. You can reach complete strangers if God gives you the opportunity to do so. Who will you make an eternal difference for? If there is any chance that this nation will turn around, that there could be, you know, could be another awakening. There have been times of awakening and revival in our nation where, where many thousands of people got saved. They, they saw God's truth and they responded by giving their life to Jesus Christ and, and cities were completely transformed. If we're going to see any kind of change in our nation, it, it starts not with better politicians better laws. It starts with people getting saved. What this nation needs is not more Republicans or less Democrats or whatever. It needs people getting saved. That's where the hope lies for any human being. Not in a political party, not in a better president, but in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul didn't say, I'm not ashamed of this politician or that one. Because they are the power of God. They are the answer for humanity. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. That's what people need. That's what we have. That's what we need to share. All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, giving his life as a ransom for many. I thank you that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that while we were children of wrath, even as others, you are a merciful God. You are rich in mercy. You love us with a great love. And you showed us grace in offering us the free gift of eternal life through the, the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, we are troubled as Christians by the condition of our nation. For us as Americans, this is not something that has always been uh, out in the open. Now, over the last several years, evil has been growing more and more bold and more and more open. 
There was a time in our nation's history where there was a, a higher standard of morality, not that it was a Christian nation per se, but there was a higher standard of morality. And now that has gone by the wayside and people are completely rejecting your truth, turning away from it. Leaders of our nation, leaders of our states, of our cities are turning away from you. And, and Lord, our nation is ripe for judgment. But just as you sent the prophet Jonah to preach to Nineveh, a city that was the godless capital of a wicked nation that had oppressed your people, and Nineveh, many people in Nineveh repented, and you gave them more time. Lord, I pray that you would help Christians in our nation to be Christians, to stand firm on the truth, not to be pushed over by society, we have the solid rock on which to stand. This world does not. I thank you that uh, as powerful as our enemy seems, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Lord, help us to stand in your truth. Help us to obey God rather than man. There is a, a world of souls, and as we even think about our situation here, a nation of souls, a city of souls here in Beaufort, and Port Royal, and Burton, and Bluffton, and Okatee, Ladies Island, souls that need to be saved. And you have us strategically scattered throughout this community so that we can be a witness here. Help us to do that. Give us opportunities. You equip some to do some uh, things for you and equip others to do other things. But Lord, however you've equipped us, we all have the same responsibility, and that is to go and to bring the truth with us. I pray you'd help us to do that. Give us opportunities as a church. Give us opportunities as individuals to make the name of our Savior known in this community, that we would see many lives turn to you as, as your truth is heard and is accepted. And how will they hear unless someone preach to them? So, Lord, help us. Help us to be faithful proclaimers, preachers of your word, that the work that you did in us and are continuing to do that we will see that done in other lives as people believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, have, have you believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you saved? That doesn't happen by being good. That doesn't happen by coming to church, by putting any money in the offering plate, by being a charitable individual. Those are all nice things to do. But God doesn't let people into heaven by being nice. You have to go through Jesus Christ. He is the way. And maybe you're here tonight and you're trying to find God your own way. You'll get lost. You'll, you'll remain lost if you continue going your own way. Follow what Jesus has said. Follow his truth. Believe on him. Believe on what he has done. Living a perfect life. Dying a sacrificial death in substitution for your sin. Taking on God's wrath. He became wrath for us, who were children of wrath, even as others. And yet he was willing to do that so that we could take on his righteousness. And when God sees a Christian, he sees the righteousness of his son. Do you need to receive Jesus Christ tonight? Do you need to believe on his name? You could do so where you're seated. You could believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ right where you're seated. Just accept what he has said. We do have counselors that are available. If you would like some help looking up Bible verses, we would love to point you in the right direction. Ultimately, the decision is yours. We're not here to force anybody to do anything. You have a choice to make. God has given us a free will. What will you choose to do with Jesus Christ? Christian, you are understandably dismayed by the condition of our nation. What are you going to do about it? Give the gospel to somebody. Make a difference in one life at a time. Fulfill the Great Commission. Leave the results up to God. We can't force people to be saved, but we can give them the gospel. God is the one that has the power, not us. So give the gospel. Witness faithfully. Pray for fruit. Just do what God has called you to do. As we have this time of invitation, in just a minute, as you kind of place, I'd encourage you to surrender yourself. If you need to be saved, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Just make that decision to do that now. Nothing is stopping you. It's free. It's a free gift. If you are saved, then regardless of how many 
people you have talked to about the Lord, how many times you've given the gospel, regardless of how many years you've been saved, you need to be a better witness. I need to be a better witness. So let's, let's commit ourselves anew tonight to be a better witness tomorrow, to be a better witness this week for Jesus Christ. Father, please work in our hearts. I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. I thank you that you meet our spiritual needs. You correct us when we're wrong. You give us the information, the doctrine, the, 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 the reproof, the correction, the instruction in righteousness that we need to get right and to stay right, to live the way you would have us to live. Help us to do that. Help us to accept the rebuke of your word, knowing that you rebuke us because you love us and you want us to get right. Help us to be right. Help us to be faithful witnesses this week of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand to your feet, please, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Commit yourself to the Lord. Be a faithful witness this week. Whether you take some gospel tracts, I've got copies of John and Romans you could take with you. Share your testimony with somebody. Do something to reach somebody for Christ this week. Leave the fruit, leave the results up to God. But do your part in sowing the seed.